All right, our next speaker is a secular humanist and holds a doctorate in social psychology. He is the host of The Dr. Bo Show, where he takes critical thinking, reason, and science-based approach to issues that matter with the goal of educating and entertaining. And he's also the author of The Concept. Please welcome to the stage, Bo Bennett. Thank you, Lauren. Hello, everybody. I'd like to offer a big, genuine thank you to the organizers of Skepticon for inviting me to this wonderful event, and a big sarcastic thank you to the couple in the room next to mine, who, through their expression of love, kept me up for a good portion of the night. <laughs> a little bit groggy, you know why. <laughs> the one next to yours. My mother was a wonderful and interesting woman. Her library included the Bible, the many works of L. Ron Hubbard, books on UFOs and alien encounters, ghosts, healing crystals, you name it, and she's read it, and she believed most of it. She would explain these strange worlds to me, perhaps to open up my mind to other possibilities, which I believe it did. But it also had a side effect. Thoughts of body-snatching aliens, soul-possessing demons, voyeuristic angels, and other spiritual beings with a seemingly strong motive to enter my room at night, terrified the bejesus out of me for the first 30 plus years of my life. I slept with my parents until I was literally 12 years old, <laughs> figuring that would decrease the odds of getting snatched by an unwelcome space invader. When I lived on my own during my college years, I would sleep with the TV on each night, reasoning that aliens and demons would be tricked into thinking I had other people over and would move on to the next room. And into my adult years, I would sleep mummified in the blankets, thinking that somehow a one millimeter thick sheet would protect me from the anal probe of an intergalactic visitor. <laughs> but something wonderful happened about 10 years ago. I discovered science and reason. Science and reason, along with critical thinking, and logic allow us to see the world for what it most likely is, not what it irrationally, what we irrationally think it is. Now, I would estimate that roughly about 95% of Americans believe in some sort of woo. And this is mostly due to the fact that the, the human mind is conducive to woo. Now, I know what you guys are thinking. You're thinking, hey, we're skeptics. We don't believe in any of that crap. Well, maybe, maybe not. We'll see. But don't worry about it, because just because we're skeptical thinkers, you know, we're not, doesn't mean we're, that we're immune to woo. If woo is a disease, consider this presentation, the vaccine. Which, by the way, like all other vaccines, definitely does not cause autism. <laughs> all right, I want to tell you what this presentation is not. This isn't about debunking any specific claims of woo. So for example, if you want to go ahead and put garlic up on your door to keep away vampires, Go ahead. I'm not going to tell you that that's not going to work. This isn't about attempting to convince you that no forms of woo are real. So you remember that little trip that you took back in college when you were experimenting with those drugs? And you and Barney the Purple Dinosaur were ruling a galaxy of gingerbread army? Remember that? Well, I'm not going to tell you that that really didn't happen. It might have. That's not my job here. And this presentation is not about providing exact criteria for what Wu is and what Wu is not. Every time I do this presentation, inevitably, somebody comes up after and says, hey, Bo, you know, I liked what you're talking about, and, and the whole the vaccine thing and autism, I am right with you there. But when you talked about alien abduction, <laughs> you know, I got this uncle, and, he, and you know the rest of the story. So I don't want to get in those kind of debates. I will have to set some examples and talk about it a little bit, but we'll move on. What this presentation is about, this is about looking at the psychological reasons for why we tend to believe in Wu. So let's start with two general reasons for why we believe in anything. Reason number one, the evidence supports the belief. That is, we use reason. Clear enough, right? Reason number two, everything else. <laughs> These other reasons for belief do not speak to the truth claim. Now I want to talk a little bit about a primer. I need to really go into this in some detail. It's a primer about bottom-up versus top-down processing. And this has to do with perception. 
So perception is a very important part, obviously, of Wu, and we'll see why in a moment. But perception, there's two parts to it, bottom-up. Bottom-up is defined as information from sensory input to the brain. So for example, if I'm looking at that chair, we have the light ref reflecting off the chair, it's going in through my eyes, back to my retinas, picked up by the rods and cones, it's being transduced, it's going through the optic nerve into my brain, and I get a message. Now this is pretty much objective in the sense that as long as we all have the same equipment, we're getting the same general signal. Pretty much the same thing is happening. The second part of perception is very subjective. It's very different. This is called top-down processing, which is defined as the brain's use of knowledge, beliefs, and expectations to interpret this sensory information. So once again, the chair example, once I see that it's coming up, now I know that that is a chair. I have a knowledge that that's a chair. I believe it's a chair, and I expect a chair to be here given the, the facility and what we're doing here. So I could easily recognize that as a chair. Now, you're probably wondering, you're, you're trying to make the connection, and it's difficult to understand because we all know what a chair is. But take a look at this image. Now, do you know what it is? And if you do, just raise your hand. OK, so most people, um, virtually everybody at first, when you look at this, all it looks like is a bunch of black and white splotches. And that's what is known as the, the bottom-up processing. That's what's going on right now. You're just seeing that sensory information. There's no beliefs or expectations or knowledge that has clicked in yet. So all you see is black and white. So what is it? Who, who knew what it was? Cow. It's a cow, right. The cow is looking right at you. You got the ears and the nose and the eyes. Now, if you don't see it, you see it now? In the rectangle, that's the cow's face. I'm going to go back to the picture and keep that in mind. Now take a look at this picture. You see it? Does everyone see it? No? Still some people don't? All right, one more time. Cow, face, look at, look at the dark ears, the nose, the eyes, going back, whoop, cow. All right. So what just happened? Your top-down processing kicked in. Now you know it's a cow. When you look at this, you see something, you perceive it completely differently than you did just a moment ago because of that top-down process that kicked in. Here's the thing. In the absence of evidence and knowledge, perception, or the top-down processing, is a result of our beliefs and expectations. You guys are familiar with this picture, right? This was on social media. It made its rounds not too long ago. It's a picture, I guess, the Mars rover took of Mars. And people freaked out. They said, oh my god, there's a woman. There's a woman on Mars. Some people did. Now, I hope when we all look at this picture, as skeptics in this room, we see it and we say, hey, wow, look at that. It's a, it looks like a lady, and we move on. However, that's not how everybody sees this. When some people see this, they say, wow, look at that. That is a woman on Mars. Why? Because they have beliefs and expectations. They don't have knowledge. They don't rely on evidence. What they have is they have beliefs and expectations. They have beliefs that there are people living on Mars, that there are beings on Mars who built the pyramids and all that stuff. And they have expectations, expectations that our government, you know, the secret government, they're covering all this up because they don't want us to know about it. So they have these beliefs and expectations, so they perceive this very differently than we do. So this is the general cycle here. We have our beliefs and expectations, and that serves as sort of the foundation for our perceptions and interpretations. The beliefs and expectations serve as the foundation for perceptions and interpretations. And once we perceive something, then it feeds into our beliefs again, strengthens our beliefs. So that picture that we just saw, if somebody were to see that and they believed and expected that that was a real lady, that would further support their beliefs. So next time they saw a pyramid or something, of Mars, they would have a stronger belief and they would perceive it differently. They would be more quick to perceive it as like a real human-made or being-made pyramid. But there is a way around this, and that's by injecting evidence and knowledge. Once we do that, if we say, okay, we have a higher regard for evidence, we want evidence, and we know we have the knowledge, we'll look into it, we realize that it's very difficult for people to be walking around on Mars. So with that knowledge and understanding about all the missions and the pictures that were taken and so forth, with that knowledge and evidence, it will feed into our perceptions, it will give us different perceptions, more accurate perceptions, and that will correct our beliefs. And then we have those new beliefs that further feed into new perceptions. So by injecting evidence and knowledge, we could kind of correct 
this mistake. So let's define Wu. What is Wu? Wu is concerned with emotions, mysticism, or spiritualism. It's other than rational or scientific, mysterious, new agey. And Wu often involves the supernatural, the paranormal, mysticism, quackery, or pseudoscience. Now, one important thing about Wu, people always, when, they, when they're talking about Wu, they generally say, well, something's either Wu or it's not Wu. It doesn't work that way. Wu is on a spectrum or a continuum. On one end, you have not at all Wu. The other end, you have classic Wu, and then you've got a lot of stuff in the middle that's just kind of Wu-ish. So what are some examples? Like chemistry, all right? Yeah, not at all Wu. I'm good with that. Wu-ish, chiropractic care. You've got elements of chiropractic care that are very science-based, and then you have elements that aren't quite science-based at all, that are pretty much classic Wu. So you put them together, so I just threw that in the middle. And you have classic Wu. What is it? Astrology, right. All right, so let's get into the seven reasons, the seven reasons why our brain favor mysticism and magic over rationalism and reality. Reason number one, we're born believers. Recent findings suggest that there are two foundational aspects of religious belief, belief in divine agents and belief in mind-body dualism, and they both come naturally to young children. This is a researcher, Paul Bloom. He does a lot of work in this area. But one thing that we need to understand, it's understood by virtually all scientists who work with the mind and the brain, that the mind is actually a function of the brain. That is, without the brain, there is no mind. Scientists understand this. Cognitive scientists, researchers, neuroscientists, they understand this. You manipulate the brain, the physical brain, and you change the mind. You, you put alcohol in your body and you change your mind. You could, we could shut off certain pieces of the brain through, through like physical manipulation and you could change the way people think, act. We know about diseases like Alzheimer's disease that changes the way people think and their memories. It's very clear that the mind is a function of the brain. And this is what's known as monism. However, Paul Bloom talks about something called common sense dualism. And that's something that we're born with, we have as children. There's an experiment done by Beering and Borkling. And what they did is they told children of, of different ages and adults, they told them about this mouse that died. And they asked the children and adults about some specific properties of the mouse. So the children and adults, they both understood the physical properties of death. They understood that the heart wasn't beating anymore. They understood that the, the blood wasn't flowing and the, the mouse wasn't breathing, so they understood what death was. However, children took it one step further, and when asked, the children thought that the mouse still had feelings. The mouse still had desires. And what was really interesting about this is the kids thought this even though the parents didn't, even though, though the parents were atheists. The kids still had this impression, which leads, of course, to this whole idea of common sense dualism, that we're kind of born dualists. There's also something known as the over-attribution of agency and design, which is a willingness to attribute uh, physiolo uh, physiological states, including agency and design, even when it's inappropriate to do so. So another example of this is um, the, what the researchers did is they had these pictures of pointy rocks, and they asked the children and adults again, why are the rocks pointy? And the adults would say something such as, well, probably through millions of years of geological formation and pressures and so they got the point. But when the children answered, they said something like, so animals could scratch their backs on them. Indicating against this, this agency, this design, like they're there for a purpose. Everything has a purpose. And once again, we see this with children with atheist parents or parents who don't believe. So as skeptics, we all need to ask this question. Well, maybe... Just maybe this worldly knowledge that we all have, this whole science and reason thing, maybe this is distracting us from this common sense truth that we're all born with. It, it's a fair question. And I know it's been asked by me plenty of times or by other people to me. But no, that's not what's going on here. There's a lot of problems with this hypothesis, and here's why. Common sense tells us that the Earth is flat. It's not. Common sense tells us that objects are solid. They're not. They're actually about 99.99999999% empty space. Common sense tells us that heavier objects drop faster than lighter ones. They don't. Common sense tells us that if we flip a fair coin five times in a row and it comes up 
heads, then tails is do. It's not. Each flip is independent of the one before. And common sense tells us that the winning lottery numbers, 23, 5, 14, 34, 8, 38, is far more likely than 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. It's not. And virtually everything related to quantum mechanics, the most well-supported scientific theory ever developed, is against common sense. So no, worldly knowledge is not distracting us from the truth. It is because of worldly knowledge that we could actually know the truth. Reason number two, we're normal. Mental trickery, otherwise known as cognitive biases, is the normal condition, not an abnormal one. Understanding how and why our minds consistently fool us helps us to better interpret these experiences we have. And there are plenty of ways, plenty of ways that our minds fool us and trick us. One way that most of you are probably aware of is uh, pareidolia. It's a type of illusion or misperception involving a vague obs or obscure stimulus being perceived as something clear and distinct. Facial recognition is one of the most common forms of this. And there's also auditory and textual. So once again, we see this picture. And all of us, hopefully in this room, will say, wow, look at that. It looks like a face. And we'd move on. However, some other people may see this and say, yeah, it looks like a face. And, I, and here's what happened. There was this Native American tribe that was walking over here, and they got slaughtered. And then this is the, the, their spirits pushed out of the mountain and made this face as a sign of whatever, of, of their everlasting souls, spirits. So what we have is we have people taking these, these naturally occurring things that look like something else, attaching their narrative to it, and then coming up with an explanation. And we've seen this before, right? Pictures of Jesus and toast, the nun bun, I mean, you name it. This happens all the time. It's very clear. We, we're trained to see faces and see other images. Here's an, a great example, a really funny example of pareidolia, textual pareidolia. This came up on my Facebook feed about two months ago. One of my friends posted this video from a pastor, and the pastor in this video was in front of his congregation, and he said that he found the secret code in the Bible. <laughs> now, you got to listen. The first book of the Bible, Genesis, has names in the Bible. The first 10 names of the people listed in the Bible, if you take their names, you translate their names, and you put them all in order, and you add some uh, filler in words, right? <laughs> what you get is a prophecy about Jesus. So, for example, Adam equals man, Seth equals appointed, Enoch equals mortal, and here's the prophecy. Man has appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down teaching, and his death shall bring the despairing comfort. This is a part where you're supposed to go, ooh, because that's what his congregation did. So I explained to my friend on Facebook, I said, this is a perfect example of textual pareidolia. What you're basically doing is you're just picking names, and there's dozens of definitions that you could choose from. You could put them all together. You could add in filler words. You could make it say anything. It's like putting together a puzzle with all square pieces of the same color and the same size. Not hard, folks. And of course, I got what I expected. I was called a cynic. I was called a heathen and many other names that I don't want to go over. So I decided to prove it to her. So what I did is I went on my Facebook feed. I looked at the first six names of the people on my Facebook and I took their names in order, mind you. I got their, the definitions for their names, and I added a couple filler words. And I came up with my own prophecy about Jesus, and here it goes. From a bee swarm, from the wood of the royal forest, will come a loving and beautiful man wearing a wreath of honor they will call healer. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Not hard to do. Hallucinations. We all know what hallucinations are. They happen all the time. It's an experience involving the apparent perception of something that's not present. Most of us are familiar with visual hallucinations, but there's also auditory and tactile hallucinations. Two of the most common types of hallucinations that people experience are hypnopompic and hypnogogic hallucinations. Hypnopompic is when we're waking up from a sleep. Our temporal lobes are still, and our frontal lobe is still asleep. 
It's not fully activated. So we're coming out of this, and it's kind of like a dream state, but we're awake, so we see things. So basically, they're hallucinations, and these are pretty common. And hypnagogic is the opposite. It's when we're going to sleep, we experience this. What most people don't realize about hallucinations is they're very common for everybody. Here are just some of the, the, the ways that we hallucinate, some of the reasons for stress, dehydration, lack of sleep, fatigue, slipping between consciousness and unconsciousness, intoxication, and sensory deprivation. Now, if you look at this list, we experience at least a few of those every single day, don't we? Hallucinations are very common, and of course, there are other reasons, like for serious mental illness, if you have schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and so forth, there are hallucinations that are associated with that that are more serious. But for the most part, hallucinations are common. Now, what you guys are probably thinking is, wait a minute, I don't hallucinate all the time, but do we actually know that? What you don't do, and you probably don't do, is have bizarre hallucinations. That is, you don't picture like flying dinosaurs. In fact, I did see a dinosaur walking around the hall here a couple days ago. But you don't have bizarre ones, but you never know, because if you're on a walk and you're jogging and you're tired, you're exhausted, you're sweaty, and you see like a, a guy walking his dog in the distance, that might not be there. If you see a tree, that might not be there. It, it could be your mind playing tricks on you, but they're just so common you don't even realize it. So they could be a lot more common than people think. So when people say that, they, they don't call them hallucinations. What do people call these? Visions, right. So when they say they had a vision, they usually say they had, they had this vision for a reason, yeah. But the reason is more likely due to fatigue than any kind of telepathic communication. Anomalous experience. This is an unusual experience that can't be explained with the current knowledge. But here's the thing, a lot of experiences that people think we can't explain, we actually can. Modern neuroscience can explain and even recreate many of these experiences. Do you guys know about the God Helmet? This is a, a researcher, a neuroscientist, I believe it was up in Canada. He took this helmet, he put electrodes on it that shoots out this um, magnetic impulse. And what that does is it throws off the synchronization of temporal lobes on the side of your head. When that happens, you get this really weird sensation that somebody is actually there. It's called a feeling of presence or a sense of presence, that somebody's in the room with you even though nobody's actually in the room. And you, they could recreate this by putting this helmet on and just putting anybody in this helmet. Now here's the interesting thing, and I, I want you to think about this. If you didn't know anything about science, you didn't know anything about the brain, how this works, and you had one of these experiences, and nobody is in the room with you, and you come, let's say, from a Catholic background where you believe that Jesus is near you or Mother Mary or your guardian angel, then it's easy to understand how people could go and default to that, and that could help inform their perceptions. Their beliefs informs their perceptions. So if you don't know the science, then you only have one thing to draw on, and that's basically your beliefs. So basically, we, some people have just limited choices. Reason number three, we're emotional. Uh, what did he say when he was crying? He had a famous line. I, I sin, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner. We often accept claims emotionally, not rationally. What emotion does is it lowers our rational defenses, and then we engage in a process called rationalization. So I'd like to explain this to you with an example that is a little bit close to home for me and probably for some of you as well. Multi-level marketing. Imagine you're home one day and you're just kind of hanging around, you're not doing much, and your friend calls you, I'm out of the blue, and says, you gotta come down to this, this party that is going on, it's wonderful, it's free, it's at a hotel, and it, it's dinner is included, you're gonna have a great time. So you're like, all right, I'm not doing anything else, why not? So you get in your car and you meet your friend there. You come through and you go into a room very similar to this one. You're sit, sitting down in these chairs. And then this guy comes out on stage with one of those Britney Spears microphones, you know, and has like Anthony Robbins energy. Hey, everybody, what's going on? Woo! And then you're like, oh, boy, I know what's going on here. So what do you do? The first thing you do is, is you're, you're skeptical, of course, because we're all skeptics. So we sit down cross our legs, cross our arms, get in that defensive position, you know, because we're not, we're not going to buy anything that's going on here. And then we're leaning backwards, you know, with that skeptical eye. So we're, we're sitting down like this for about, for about a good 10 minutes, but something happens. This guy's energy and his charisma is just amazing. 
And he's talking about this stuff, and he says, do you want financial freedom? And you're like, yeah, okay, yeah, I want financial freedom, sure. Do you want to live the life of your dreams? And then slowly your arms start to uncross and you start to lean forward. Yeah, you know, I could do that. That sounds great. And then the next thing you know, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then a little bit later, you're driving home with a box next to you, 10-year <laughs> supply of $40 per bar GMO-free soap. And when you get home, the, your whole energy level and that, those, the adrenaline that was going through your blood and you know, all that starts to go down. And then you say, what the hell did I just do? <laughs> now you would think at this point, most people would simply just go, go back in their car and return that box of crap. But no, that doesn't happen. Why? Because we rationalize. We don't want to admit that we were just taken. We don't want to admit that we were manipulated that we were a sucker, that we fell for something. So what do we do? We say, all right, well, you know what? That soap really did smell good. I mean, yeah, it does smell good. And I really could use this extra part-time job. So you start to rationalize. And then the next thing you know, you're in. So what happened? You had this, normally your, your rational defenses were up. Then the emotion took it down. They sold you. They slipped you the woo. You bought into it. And then your emotion came down again and the rational defenses came up, but now you still believed in that woo because you, you rationalized it on an intellectual level, basically. So think about that example and tell me, can you think of any other examples where emotion might be used to lower our rational defenses? Church. Church. Politics. Politics. Buying a car. Buying a car, buying anything, yeah. Gambling going on a day. <laughs> you guys get it. There, there's a lot of different examples where you could see how people could use emotion to lower our rational defenses, slip in the woo, we rationalize it, and now we're kind of stuck with it. And if it's that difficult to kind of get out of it after just buying something for like a couple hours ago, imagine buying into a religion from the time you were 13 and living with that until you're like 40. And think about how difficult it would be to get out of that. Number four, some of us are genetically predisposed, predisposed to woo. Personality is roughly 50% genetic. That means that 50% of who you are as a person is because of your parents and because of your parents' parents and so forth. The other part is environmental and, and an interaction between the, the genetics and the environment. And most personality psychologists go by something called the big five personality factors. Have you heard of those before? Big five personality, we've got, we've got agreeableness, uh, conscientiousness, openness, extroversion, and neuroticism. Each one of those traits is on a continuum. So for example, agreeableness, you could be all the way over here or you could be all the way over here, somewhere in the middle. Now three of those traits actually do relate to woo. Agreeableness, trusting, you could be too trusting, you could be too agreeable, and if you, could, if you are, woo could slip right in. Conscientiousness, cautious, opposite, the opposite of being impulsive. So if you're not conscientious enough and you're too impulsive, woo could slip right in. And openness, being open to new ideas and information, which is wonderful, it's wonderful to be open to new ideas, but you could be too open to new ideas. And if you are, woo could slip right in. Some people are more uh, prone to black and white or categorical thinking than other people. One example is, is the Bible. I've heard atheists say this before. If you can't believe all of it, then you can't believe any of it. That's a dichotomy, which is not good critical thinking. Some people, when, they, when they, you think about life, you know, we know that, that life began from this tiniest, simplest form, and it, through evolution, everybody who's here in this room and everybody else, there's tons of amazing life forms, and it's this big, continuous stream of life. Some people have a very difficult time understanding that and just, just imagining that. They like categories. They like to say, okay, there's people, there's, there's monkeys, there's dogs, there's cats. They like these clean categories. And then there's good versus evil. You know, a lot of religions talk about this ultimate good being and this ultimate bad being. And they dichotomize people in general, saying that 
there's, if, there's two types of people, good people and bad people. Good people, where do they go? Heaven. And bad people go to hell. All right. <laughs> Skepticon, all right. So they dichotomize. Some of us have a low tolerance for ambiguity or uncertainty. Think about the origin of life. You know, we don't know exactly how life began. I mean, we're working on it, we're figuring it out, but we don't know exactly. Some people are very uncomfortable with this. Some people are much more comfortable saying, okay, if somebody comes up to them and says, I know how life began, I can tell you, God did it. It's like, okay, it's good enough for me. As long as it's certain and it's easy to simple understand, that's good. That's what some people need. They don't like this ambiguity. Now think about this. Think about science as an endeavor. Science is all about ambiguity, right? Science is probabilistic. We come up with, with, uh, with theories and we come up with hypotheses and everything is contingent upon new information. We hold things provisionally until other information comes along and people don't like that. Some people don't like that and you could see how some people could be anti-science because of that. They like certainties, even when no certainties actually exist. And research demonstrates that low tolerance for ambiguity is strongly correlated to magical thinking. And magical thinking is where basically woo slips right in. And some people have a more intuitive than analytic thinking style. A lot of us here, I bet, are analytic, more analytic thinkers, but some people like to just go with their gut. Now, one thing I do want to point out that is that predisposition is not the same thing as being destined. If somebody is predispositioned for something, it just means that their genetic and environmental tendencies push them in one direction, but it doesn't mean that they cannot be swayed. The more that we educate people and give, give, understand uh, the, the value of reason and education, the more we could do that, that does change the environment and could move them down the scale. So predisposition does not mean destined. Number five, accepting woo takes a lot less effort than rejecting it. The brain, think about the brain, it's this little piece of meat, right? It's only about three pounds, you can hold it in your hand, and this takes up about 20% of all of our energy in the body. It takes up a heck of a lot of energy for such a little piece of meat. Now if you think about our ancestral environment, we were short on food for the most part. We had hunters and scavengers, and food wasn't like you know, it is now in, in this culture where it's constantly available. So in order to conserve energy, one of the best ways that evolution could tell us how to conserve energy is to keeping our brain power down, our cognitive power. One of the ways we do this is through something called heuristics. It's kind of like a mental shortcut. Instead of actually using a lot of analytical power, we use heuristics. But the problem with these heuristics is that they lead to all types of errors in reasoning. And all of this strengthens our belief in Wu. One example is favoring simplistic fab fables over complex truths. So virtually every culture has a creation story culture, a creation story. And these are all what, what they have in common. They're incredibly simple, right? Anything you could teach to like a, a five-year-old, somebody in second grade, I think I'd learned the creation story, biblical creation story when I was going through religious school in third grade or second grade. So very clear, very easy to understand. Now compare that to like the scientific explanation of, of the universe and everything. You have to add in a little bit of quantum physics, you have to add in cosmology, you have to understand molecular biology. There's so much involved. It's, it's overwhelming a lot of times, so it's very easy just to say, ah, the hell with all that. You know, the creation story, that's much easier, I'll just go with that one. So we're kind of predisposed to, to, to keep this cognitive energy down to a minimum. But realize that that was important in our ancestral environment. It's not important now. Now we're being lazy. All right, ready to have some fun? Reason number six, our brains are bad at probabilistic and statistical thinking. What I'm going to do is I'm going to telepathically project a number into all of your heads, okay? Now, you're all not gonna get the number because all of you aren't telepathically intelligent. Only a small percentage of you are. So I'm going to go ahead and do it, and I want you to concentrate and try to get the number. Ready? Yeah. Well, no, 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 don't say it now. Hold on to it. Okay? Think of that number. I want you to be honest. I'm going to tell you what the number was, and I want you to raise your hand or stand up or shout out if you actually got it, okay, and be honest. Oh, you know, I just forgot. <laughs> It has to be from 1 to 100. 
I forgot to set some limitations on it, okay? So I'm going to do it again, because that was kind of unfair. Ready? Yeah. You get it? Okay, here we go. The number was 46. Did anyone get it? 46. You were close, right, but you didn't get it. You were off. You have to work on your telepathic powers, sir. <laughs> All right. So why did I do this? Well, what was going on in your mind? Two things were going on. First, you were kind of thinking, oh, this would be really cool if I got the number. And if you did get the number, if somebody in here did get the number, it, they would feel like, holy crap, you know what? I, I felt it. You know, I did see the number. It popped in my mind. <laughs> and even though we're all skeptics here. Now, and then all of us are also thinking, well, come on. I mean, let's look at, there's probably at least like 150 people here. The number from 1 to 100, statistically, somebody's going to get the number, right? And of course, that's not a guarantee, and nobody got it, which means that we are all bad at psychic prediction. <laughs> so this is just to kind of give you the difference between kind of what goes on our rational mind and emotional mind. There are a few different examples of this, the availability heuristic, the neglect of probability. Imagine that you're, you, you turn on TV one night and you're watching, let's say it's, um, uh, what's, a, what's, a, what's a TV show, uh, 60 Minutes. And you see this family all sitting down by a fireplace and they're all kind of huddled about and they're, they're, their eyes are tearing and they're telling this story about their two-year-old son that they just lost. And he died because he went to go get vaccinated. He had a horrible adverse reaction. And it, I mean, it's a horrible story, and it happens. And you're watching this, and you're human. You have emotions. You have empathy. And you feel this. And you, you may even shed a tear. And it, it just, it just like, it, it tugs on your heartstrings. So a year later, somebody comes up to you and asks you about vaccine safety. And the first thing that comes to your mind is that horrible image of that family crying and that story. And they ask you, are vaccines safe? And you say, you know, I, I don't think so. I don't think they're safe. I wouldn't do it. Because what you're thinking about is that one piece of information that is available to you because of that emotion. You're not thinking about the millions of children whose lives were saved because of vaccines. That's a, stati a statistic. That's not what you're thinking of. You're thinking of that emotional experience that was available. A much lighter example, the availability cascade in fad diets. I like to call this the Dr. Oz effect. Why? Because let's say that you're, you know, you're skeptical, we're all skeptical, and somebody's talking about this new fad diet that came out, this new liquid diet or whatever, and you're not buying into it, but you hear it like Dr. Oz is talking about it, it's on your Facebook feed, on your Twitter feeds, your friends are talking about it, the soccer moms are talking about it, the people at work are talking about it, everybody's talking about it, and the more people talk about it, the more you start to say, okay, maybe there's something to this. All right, maybe I'll give it a try. And what do you do? You try it, and for the next three weeks, you're pooping out water. The more something is available, the more you're actually thinking about it, and the more you tend to believe it. There's the frequency illusion. This is like when you're just, a great example of this is looking for signs, like if you're looking for a sign, you'll find it. Or the whole idea of good luck, bad luck, right? If, if you think you're gonna have good luck, everything you see, you perceive it differently, and you think about luck, right? Good luck, bad luck, and reason number seven, feeling important is more important than being right. This is a gentleman named Dale Carnegie. Now, he was born a long time ago, but back in 1936, he was one of the first, like, self-help gurus. And you're probably thinking, ah, I'm not into that self-help crap. But you have to respect this guy for his social science ability because he was a wonderful social scientist. He actually did a lot of research um, in, in talking to people who were uh, very wealthy, talking to people who had a high sense of well-being and great communication skills. And he wanted to see what these people had in common. One thing he found was that everybody had this strong desire for importance. We all want to be important. So where does this come in when it comes to Wu? Wu gives the average person that feeling of importance at the expense of reason and reality. And here are some examples. Faith healers, right? Imagine you're a faith healer. And yeah, there are some faith healers who are total sham artists, but other faith healers really believe that the power of God is coming through them and they could heal anybody. 
Imagine having that sense of importance, right? The whole idea of I'll pray for you, when people say, you know, I'll pray for you, I'll pray for you, they feel like they could actually do something to make your life better through this petition to their God. That is a pretty good sense of importance. And then saving your soul. I don't know about you guys, but I have somebody in my family, several people in my family, who want to save my soul. Save me from an eternity of torture and suffering. I mean, how important is that if we're a position of you here on this earth? To have that position to save people's soul from an eternity of suffering. That is a sense of importance, my friend. And it's not just with religions, exposing conspiracies. People that like to expose conspiracy theories, you know, the government is all behind it. They've got the truth, and you need to know about it. And that's how they're doing their part. Having the knowledge of cures that the medical establishment chooses to ignore and hides for financial purposes. You heard of that one before, right? Like, we know the cure for cancer. All doctors and scientists, we had it for a long time. But we'd be out of a job. You know, we don't want to be out of a job, so we're going to hide it. And then, of course, your friend sends you down to Brazil to see some witch doctor who's just going to charge you $1,000 to give you some, like, uh, mixed-up coconut leaves or whatever. <laughs> and then there's a hero complex. That's basically the whole idea that we're all heroes in our own narrative. We all feel like we're doing the right thing, and we are, we're standing up for justice, and it's all about whatever we do is the right thing. It's like everybody is the Jack Bauer in their own life story. And this is something that we all experience. All right, so a quick recap. What do we now know about Wu? Accepting Wu is our default state. Accepting Wu is normal. It plays on our emotions. Some of us may be genetically predisposed to Wu. Accepting Wu is easier than rejecting it. We are generally bad at probabilistic thinking, and Wu makes us feel important. And this is just a fraction, just a fraction of the psychological factors that contribute to our belief in Wu. When you combine them all together, what we have is demonstrable evidence of why belief in Wu is so ubiquitous. So I'll leave you with some last piece of advice here. We're all usually, uh, people come up to us and they like to say, you know, I, I've, got, uh, I, I've got this, I understand this Wu, and <laughs> I don't want to, I've I got this great story I want to tell, but I, it's going to take at least five minutes and I don't have the time for that. All right, I'll skip that story. You could spend a lifetime attempting to debunk all the types. So talk to me after, I'll tell you. You could spend a lifetime really going after all these different types of woo, and people will come up to you and present you with all these different types of woo. It's so tempting, so tempting to go and start Googling things and to find out about all specific types of woo and why it's wrong, but don't do it. Instead, just to think about what we talked about. Think about the psychological factors that are involved in why people believe in woo and educate them on these psychological factors as to why they probably believe. Once they do that, it might not get them right away. They might not immediately connect. In fact, they probably won't. But it will spark this cognitive dissonance that will happen. And once that does happen, maybe a month down the road, maybe a year down the road, they'll start looking into things a little bit more better, and then they'll, they'll start to understand of, and make the difference between woo and what is woo and what is not woo. They'll understand that their beliefs were not actually due to evidence. But what was it due to? That whole something else that we were talking about. Thank you very much, everybody.